Okay, here we go. Yo, I'm sitting here and even I'm taken aback. Like, I feel like I just stepped back in time or maybe I just aged and this man hasn't aged a day. But, <laughs> yo, I got to give it up. I know we're going to get into this interview, but St. Louis owned. This man has had hit record after hit record and don't look like he aged one damn day. Give it up for St. Louis' own Chingy. Chingy, welcome to Vlad TV, man. What's up, my brother? I always appreciate Vlad's platform because he's, since the beginning, he's had me on, man. And um, I appreciate that and I appreciate being here. Appreciate y'all having me here. Absolutely, absolutely. So before we get into your story, and I know that you were on the platform a while ago, so I'm going to take it back to the beginning and we just going to, go from then and bring it up to current. But um, All right. I got to ask, like, what are you doing? Like, are you vegan or are you out <laughs> running marathons? Like, how <laughs> did you find the fountain of youth? Like, what are you doing? What I'm doing, um, actually, what I'm doing is just mental discipline to get you far in life. So I am vegan. You know, I try, mm. to, I try to eat healthy. I exercise. Um, I don't, I try my best not to consume a lot sugar, a lot of sugar, um, dairy products, and I don't eat meat, I don't eat fish. And I try my best to keep a balanced mentalism. You know what I mean? And, and, and look forward to positivity and balanced situations in my life. And so I think uh, a lot of that has to do with not accumulating stress and anxiety, and along with the healthy eating and working out and exercising and so, it's it's um helping me out here and uh I'm, Benjamin but I'm real live Benjamin Button. Somebody told me that before. Tell me some damn <laughs> Chingy, you Benjamin Button. <laughs> you really you really are, man. I'm like, yo, you drinking straight from the fountain of you for what? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, man. I, I I I work hard on trying to stay healthy, man, and I always try to share it. You know, when people are interested and open minded, I. Just let them know what I'm doing uh, to, to stay fit and stay healthy. Just for my own knowledge, um, how long have you been living this lifestyle? And what made you even start to begin with? How long I've been living this lifestyle and what made me start to begin with? Well, it, it started a while ago. I've, I've, since a kid, I've never been, and I'm going to be honest, I never liked the torturing and killing of animals. I, ain't, I, I, I always thought it wasn't right. You know what I'm saying? I don't think we would appreciate if some alien race came from out of the sky came down here and said, we just eat human babies. How y'all feel about that? I don't think we would mm -hmm. like that. You know, we can tend to, humanity can tend to look down upon animals. You know, they do have mothers and fathers and siblings just like we do. They are living creatures just like we are, but we can tend to look down on that. Um, the journey started back in about 98, 99. That's when I quit eating beef and pork. And so as the, as the years progressed and um, around 2010, 2011, that's when I stopped eating chicken, turkey, fish, and all the rest of the meats. And then as it progressed, years went by more, um, then I stopped dairy and sugar and all of that. And also it has a, a profound effect on my immune system. And so, you know, I break out from eating dairy and sugar and stuff. And, and, and the meat and stuff didn't work too well with me as well. You know, it got, don't get me wrong, it has its nutrients. The meat can have its nutrients, but overall as well, it can also be, um, it can destroy your arteries and organs as well mm -hmm. when it build up. And so um, why I started this journey, I don't like the, I think it's selfish to slaughter animals. And also it just didn't work with my immune system I didn't like what it was doing to my immune system. Understood. Okay, let's get into it. St. Louis own. What was it like growing up in St. Louis at the time? Because I know me, like the rest of the world, we got to know you through rap music. Right. And um, back in the days when you really popped off, the East Coast was doing this thing. West Coast was doing this thing. But it was the, the mid, like you were on the front line of that whole Midwest mm -hmm. thing. What was it like coming up in St. Louis at that time? What it was like coming up in St. Louis at that time. Now, beginning of my career or even before that? Before that. Okay. Before, Early days. Before that, um, I think just like 
any intercity adolescent who has a dream, you know what I mean? I come from the ghetto just like everybody else. I come from the inner city hood just like everybody else. I come from poverty just like every other young little individual, little dude from the hood. And so um, through my journey, I grew up in a household with my mom, dad, two brothers, and my little sister. And tough love wasn't, wasn't, mm -hmm. Mom and dad wasn't the mom and dad who, oh, come here, give me a hug and a kiss and mm, 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 throw you in the air and just, you know, they weren't like that. It was it was tough love. And so you they loved you. Don't get me wrong. You felt the love, you know, but it was we we grew up in the hood. And so how they mother and father treated them, that's how they treated us coming up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you felt that. And, you know, my old dude was a gangster and a hustler. My mother, she worked and did her. Uh, my brothers, you know, kind of took that road as well, growing up hustling and in the streets. And, you know, so, of course, that was in me as well. And uh, but I always had a dream. I always had a goal. Uh, music. At six years old, um, Easy e you had Easy e and you had Michael Jackson. These are these are who really, really, really inspired and influenced me. Michael Jackson influenced me in a way that when I saw him entertaining on stage, I was like, that's what I'm going to do. I got to do that. Make Michael Jackson rest in paradise. I love him to death. Easy e When I saw him rapping, I was like, man, I want to be like that dude. I want to do what he's doing. <laughs> so I wanted to rap. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I brought the two together, rapping and entertaining on stage. And and you have Chingy. So my top inspirations for that, and I have to include DJ Quick in on, on that too, with on the Easy E side, because mm -hmm. them were two of my, if if we talking like favorites and stuff, them were two of my favorites. Um Easy E and DJ Quick for us rappers. But um that's how that's how that's what came about where I wanted to entertain. And to this day I feel like that's what made Chingy. But um St. Louis grew up in the street like everybody else. It was rough, you know, hustling. You got drugs, poverty, gang banging, all that stuff. And so just to just to give you an insight on far as what I seen growing up in the streets and how this that St. Louis wave of drugs and gangs started. Well, my family, being the Bailey family and the Crawford family, were contributors to that like my um people aunties uncles daddy cousins used to they used to go to la to handle business but they would bring back bring back um the drug the drugs and some of the, mm -hmm. some of the gang bangers and post them up in different hoods and they do what they do now this is um, of course i'm speaking like in 86 85 um 87 you know, so I'm around this and um, my relatives were bloods in, in, the blood, you. in the blood gang. Originated from Harvard Park, Six Deuce Brims in L.A. And so they brought it to St. Louis. And I remember being around them when I was like seven. We used to be over my uncle, auntie, um, they had this apartment and it'd be about 10, 15 bloods in there. My, my, my older relatives now, we'd be playing Tecmo Bowl. I'm pretty sure you're familiar with, you know, Tecmo Bowl. Mm -hmm, we'd absolutely. be playing Tecmo Bowl and they'd be beating my ass and I'm crying and getting mad. <laughs> it used to be Crips who would come over because they needed to talk to my auntie and my uncle business. So LA Crips be coming over and I'm, I'm young, but I, I, I know pretty much what's going on. I pay attention. You know what I mean? And so they would almost get into it, the Bloods and the Crips. But because of my uncle and auntie, they, they didn't because it's business. And so that, that wave started in St. Louis. For us that, that's how the gang banging, the drug and the gang banging stuff in St. Louis, that's how that started. So when you hear Ice Cube song, St. Louis niggas want their cornerback, yep. that record, that's real. Yep. That's that's that's. That's real, real. I watched that happen. Mm. And so, mm. and so growing up in St. Louis is just like, remember DJ Quick? Just like Compton. Just like why? Wow, just like this. Just like that. You know what I mean? It's just, I had goals. I had ambition. 
I had things that I wanted to do that separated me from just diving all the way in into that type of lifestyle. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so I stuck with that. Even though I got caught up, I almost, I almost got killed before, man. I got, I almost got shot in the head, I almost got shot in the eye. You know what I'm saying? Being out there trying to do certain things and live a certain life. And that was a turning point for me. I think I was like 16, 96. Okay. And that was a that was actually a turning point for me. I remember I got my mama car shot up. So me and my brothers was, me and my brothers was riding. We was in our neighborhood about to go somewhere. And I seen two of my little homeboys fighting some older dudes. And so my brother stopped and we like, so we hop, we hop out. I just go and knock one of the dudes out. So I knock one of the dudes out, but it's a dude in the alley loading a gun that's with them. I don't see him. And so uh Ooh. my cousin was like, hey, dude, got a gun. Woo -woo -woo -woo. I just, I just walked back to the car and I just ducked my head. Cause I heard him say that. But when dude starts uh -huh, shooting, uh -huh. he starts shooting where I ducked. Because I guess he seen me hit his homeboy. So I got grazed in the head and grazed in the eye. And that was kind of a turning point for me. My mama sent me to stay with my auntie that stayed like an hour away. Cause this was the summertime. I guess she realized like he getting into too much shit. He's starting to get into too much shit. So she she sent me to live with my auntie. And so um, yeah, man, it, it's St. Louis is a it's a little it's a little town, but it's it's just like it could take on any big city. You know, St. Louis dudes ain't ain't it it's it's tough there. It's tough there. Got you. Got you. You you mentioned that your father was in the game. And um, I saw an old interview of yours, and I, I think you said that he had two Rolls Royces. Yeah. How deep in the game was your father? <laughs> uh, how deep in the game was my father? I just left St. Louis, and I'm going to tell you this. He still fly. If you see him, you'll be like, wow, he spit you out like y'all twins. He still wow. fly. He still got the up-to-date bands. He still, he still do his thing. But... um. He was a known OG gangster hustler in St. Louis. Known. He 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 had two Rolls Royces. He he stayed fly ship suit. He used to have this chain every this chain in his ring that the whole city knew. He had this Statue of Liberty gold plated emblem, like this big, with the stat. It was the Statue of Liberty. He had this ring that was about had my fist that was about from where my pinky to the middle of where my index finger, my middle finger is, that was a map of the United States with, with St. Louis being the biggest diamond. He, uh -huh. used to get, he used to get it. Like he was a well-known OG gangster in St. Louis. Like, so he, the streets, he had the streets sewn up, all, all that, you know what I'm saying? And people respected him and people love him and to this day they do, you know? And he was, he was deep in the game. Got you, got you. You just mentioned that you recently saw him. Is your mom still around? No, my mother passed in 2017. May she rest in paradise. She's not, she's, she's not around, but may she rest in paradise. But yeah, um, yeah, I just came from St. Louis uh, hanging out with Howard. So yeah, that's big Howard. So when you hear me refer to myself as Lil Howard, like in my uh -huh. music, when I'm at one call away, people always tease me about, they're like, how would you weak when I say that on the song? <laughs> and so I'm a junior. So he's big Howard. I'm little Howard. Got you. Got you. Okay, switch topics for a second. Um, you just mentioned one of my personal favorite rappers, me being from New York City. I remember in the um, mid-80s when I heard Eazy, -E, when I heard N.W.A., Q, yeah. Dre, Yeller, all of them out there. Story. Yeah. It, you know, I had never heard anything like that before. Yeah, the yeah. way them boys was spitting, the way that they was bringing it to hip hop, it was just, it, it was like coming from another planet and seeing, yeah. you know, just people living a different lifestyle, a different culture. Um, yeah. But this week um, or last week, and I'm not even sure if you're familiar with it. It, it. it was a list that went viral online, and they had the list of the 50 worst rappers of all time. Yeah, and they yeah, had yeah. Let's talk about 49. that. Did you see that? Let's yeah. talk what about that. What was your that? thought about that list? That you know, people kill me that that have nothing to do. And this is what I think about that list. They kill me. They have nothing to do. They sit around. 
I don't know if they just watching videos or anything and then they just somebody just write down some names and say, oh, these are the 50 worst rappers. I saw that and I and I heard what's the what's this guy named Jordan something? He's like a he like do an interviewer, he got like a podcast, Jordan something. And I heard him talking about it. And he was like, uh, yeah, this rapper is uh one of the worst, uh, maybe, maybe. And he said that about me, like uh Chingy, um, maybe. To himself, not even sure if if I'm the worst rapper or whatever. You know what I'm saying? And it's just absurd because here's the thing. When we when we when somebody's and the people who looking at it that's talking about it, that's really going to depth talking about it is who give it energy or it would have no energy because to me it's invalid because it's subjective. When you go around, it's seven billion people in this existence. When you ask each one of these people, well, who's your favorite rapper? Who's your favorite rapper? Who you like? You're probably gonna get a different answer. I've sold over. 50 million records worldwide. I'm, I still have success. It's people that love me. You go ask, you go ask these people that say, we love Ching. Yeah, I, lo I love Ching. He's one of my favorite artists. I had somebody tell me this the other day. So how am I one of the worst rappers? If, if everybody in this existence not saying, oh, that dude can't rap, he's the worst, then that means you're not the worst. If everybody not saying it, you're not the worst. So that, that list is absurd and it need to be done away with. Somebody got too much time on their hands. And I'm looking, they got Master P on there. They got so many people on there that have been profound, that have shown leadership, that have gave several artists a way for their dreams to come true. And they sit here mm -hmm. and disrespect these people by trying to say they the, the worst rappers. Well, I'm going to say this. It means nothing to me. Nothing at all. Because I know me. And I know I'm not one of the worst rappers. I can't be one of the worst rappers when I have all these hit records, when I have all these fans and these people who love me and they tell me every day when it's when it's when it's when it's um 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 shows like Vlad TV who who interviews me and give me time to say what I gotta say and and um promote what I gotta promote and do what I gotta do. I don't see mm -hmm. that as being somebody that's a worst rapper. You know, that's just them people's perception because they have nothing to do, so they want to sit around and just talk about others. Yeah, I mean, um, that list definitely made its rounds, and there was a lot of really good rappers on it that was. list. So it was. So music is always subjective. Just, it, I mean, it's art. Art's always subjective. It's, it's always subjective. It's funny you brought that up, too, because I was actually riding today listening to one of my songs, and just to have one of the songs, the lyrics was just real tight. I was like, damn, how could that be one of the worst rappers? <laughs> <laughs> listening to myself like that verse was hot. <laughs> Yo, um, speaking of lyrics, yo, is it true you started writing lyrics around nine or ten years old? So, so I actually started writing my own lyrics around like six, like six, seven years old. Are you serious? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nine years old is when I made my first studio song. I still know the lyrics. I'm gonna spit a little bit for you. I spit used it, hold I, on, hold on. Before you even spit them, before you even spit them, mm -hmm. what was your what was your hip hop name at that time? Okay, so. It's a story to that. My my wiser yeah. brother, meaning my older brother, OG, he said, because I used to, they used to have me battling people, like at the skating rinks and in our neighborhood. They go get people and have me battling people. He said, by the time I finished rapping and everything, everybody would shut up and nobody would say nothing when, when I'm done. So he called me Slick So, the slicker, thicker lip zipper. You know, it was hip hop. So it's just mm -hmm. he said I was slick with as a as a kid, nine year old, he said I was slick with my words. And so he called me Slick So, the slicker, thicker lip zipper. And so I wrote this song called Knuckle Up. I had a I had a, a relative of Ice who was in the street, 17, damn near see a million dollars at 17. He invested in one of my Homeboys, Kilo Manson, um, older homeboy, made rest in paradise. Um, this was 89. He had a mixtape, Kilo Manson. He was a known hot artist in the street. He had a mixtape my cousin was funding, and they wanted me to have my own song on there. I'm nine years old. They wanted me to have my own song on there. And so it was called Knuckle Up, and this was one of the verses from it. 
I used I, I started off like as a little battle rapper, but this was one of mm -hmm. the verses from it. It was like a uh, nigga knuckle up with a smooth pace. I'm beating like hard bass. You thought you was hard. That's why I'm taking it to your face and dumb. I'm not the type to give up on a smooth beat. I'm coming through the doors, breaking and shaking concrete. I'm loped out and naughty simps get choked out. Compacitate the room and everybody get smoked out. Now keep on crepping and keep on stepping. It's two feet on the stand. A mic is the weapon in my hand. So when you see me, don't buckle up. Buck them down, knuckle up. Dirty little scoundrels in effect. Now nigga, what's up? Taking the time to write a rhyme and do what you like. I rehearse the verse, get it down, pack, and then grab the mic. Kicking the flow, and I compose like Mozart. I got on my boots, dicky suit, and my car heart. Been rapping for years, I mean many ages. I got so much clientele, you can find my number in yellow pages. <laughs> and so, <laughs> that was me at nine years old. You know what I'm saying? And so, my cousin them, they was like, nah, look how we gotta get on. He gotta get his own song in this mixtape. So, when it came to St. Louis hip hop, I was always on a circuit as a little boy, always uh -huh. at the uh -huh. forefront of St. Louis hip hop. And it's um, uh, big homeboys of mine, um, Guccio, who be ro who rode with Future, Just Black and Guccio. They some they some um, hustlers and some of my older homeboys out of St. Louis that they was there too. They know that since a kid. Like, you know what I'm saying? And they, you know, a lot of people can vouch that. It, it was only a few at that time. It was only a few making noise in St. Louis at that time in, in, in 88, 89, trust me. And I'm one of them. Mm, so you really been doing this your whole life. I've been doing this my whole life, whole life. Nothing else. Don't know nothing else but this. Gotcha. Okay. Around 12 years old. Mm-hmm. You had a rap group named Without Warning. Yep. Well, 12 years how, old. How that... It well, okay, 12 years old, we was called the Two True Coalition. And this okay. I wanna let me I wanna go back just a little bit because um when you said about the Easy E N W A, that era when they ushered in, and a lot of people are not familiar, it was more conscious hip hop New York music that was out there. That's when mm -hmm. that's when that conscious music was at the forefront and had a message. A lot of kids, a yep. lot of kids today don't know nothing about that. But I was one of them kids. I'm fam I'm familiar with that. I know about that. When you had the poor righteous teachers and it it was a lot of conscious music. You know what I mean? Yes, and when it was. NWA ushered in, it brought that reality street rap in and that's when you know what I'm saying? Things started to change. But I just wanted to touch on that cuz a lot of a lot of the newer generation, a lot of they they not familiar with any of that. A lot of them. But 12 years old, two, two, two True Coalition was the name. As we, as we got wiser, mean and older, Without Warning came about around 96. Without got Warning you. came around about 96. Now, Justin Misfit, who was in a group with me and Two True Coalition, it was still me and him, but we just added our homeboy, um, um, Mike. And that's what made Without Warning. And okay. I was with a, I was with a production team called Forty Nine Productions. We was with a production team called Forty Nine Productions. My um big homeboy Mook Dollars, may he rest in paradise. Okay, so the neighborhood I'm from, it's a blood neighborhood. It's in Walnut Park, north side of St. Louis. The part where I'm from is called. You have the bad blocks. The bad blocks consist of Forty Nine Hundred. That's the address. So all mm -hmm. of these streets carry that address, 4,900. So uh, Mook Dollar started the production, 4,900, um, 49 Productions. And that was the name of the production company that Mook Dollars, he was the CEO of it. Now, just like, just like all of these hood labels get started, you know what they get started from. You know Absolutely. how they get started. You know what I mean? Yep. This was the same thing. Um, he actually, and, I, and he, he told me this, we actually had a conversation. He started it based off me doing music. And what I had going on, the group that I had, but we also had um, the Calvary, um, the Poetic Hustlers, my homeboys, the Night Riders, my homeboys, 
Baby D. We had a couple more artists that was from the hood, from our hood too, and from some other hoods that was on the label. But Without Warning mm -hmm. was the forefront. We was the face of it coming out. And so um, one of our first singles was called, and you can look it up, it's on YouTube. Everybody can look it up. It's called What's, What's Poppin' Off. Poppin off? What's Poppin' Off? Yeah, there that's when, go. and that's, you know, that back in our little young and thugging days. You know what I'm saying? You know, all with the braids and all that shit. But What's Poppin' Off? It was a, it was a local hit. It, yep. did, it did great locally. Man, we used to open up for Outkast. We used to travel outside the city. We'd be in Alaska opening up, Atlanta, California. We was moving around. And at, at that time, I forgot this guy's name. I, he, was with, he was with RCA Records or Sony Records or, damn, Eric Peterson? Eric McPherson. Okay, Eric McPherson, absolutely. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yes, absolutely. Eric McPherson. He wanted to do something with us at that time, around that time. Yep. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Are we talking about Dave McPherson? Dave McPherson. McPherson. Dave, Dave McPherson. McPherson. Yeah. Okay. My bad. Dave McPherson. Yeah. Yep. Okay, got you. Now, I know you at some point changed your name to Chingy. Yeah. Was it before or after this whole era with your group? Okay, it was actually when I changed my name to Chingy was after, a little after. So, okay, when I was with Without Warning, my name was H Thugs. Mm -hmm. I had a homeboy, one of my brother's homeboys who was like who was my homeboy too, but he 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 used to call me Lil H Thugs. And he said, because I always looked like a thug. He said, You think you always got your braids to the back with flannel shirts on and dickies? He said, nigga, you always just look like a little thug. And you know, I, mm -hmm. I, I love bone thugs and harmony, so I'll be listening to bone thugs and harmony. <laughs> and so he used he called me Lil H Thugs. But it I changed it to H Thugsy because I used to like Bugsy Siegel, the gangster. I used Got to you. always watch Bugsy Siegel movie, and I used to think I was a little smooth player my damn self. And so mix it <laughs> with a little street shit, I just called myself H Thugsy. And I that was a mixture of H Thugs and Bugsy Siegel and Bugsy. <laughs> <laughs> so that carried on, but about 99, 99, that's when I changed my name to Chingy. Now that name came from, I had a, my homeboy, well, Justin Misfit, who was in the group, who I was best friends with, his older brother, Jamal, who's like my older brother, he used to always say, uh, let's say how you say somebody balling, or you might say somebody wealthy. Well, he used to say they chingy. He used to be like, oh, damn, they chingy. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, cha-ching, like money, yep. but. So, so that was literally his word. That wasn't like that a was word a, that the well, it was a, use? It was, it was like an inner circle word. Like okay, this wasn't you. no shit everybody was saying. This literally was an inner circle word that I heard Jamal saying first. And so mm. I was like, damn, they got a ring to it. I like that shit. I'm going to make that my stage name. And so <laughs> I just made it my stage name and it just stuck. I, I felt like it was a good stage name. Nah, it definitely has that stick. Like, like Chingy, you hit and yeah. you know that name. Yeah. All right. Uh, I want to move this thing on to around 2000, 99, 2000. Yep. Ludacris releases his first solo album and it blows up. And Nelly, around the same time from your backyard, he releases his first solo mm -hmm. album, Country Grammar, and it blew up. Yeah. And I think Nelly came out a little one... bit before Chris. Correct. Yeah. Yep. And they came out in the same time frame, I remember. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember, you know, he, he, we really started to look at that whole St. Louis area. And I bring these two names up because they're significant in your story. Right. Um, did you know Nelly before he blew up? Did you know him before he got his deal and, and that whole country grammar thing just took off? Did I know Nelly? It's funny because I just talked to Chris recently and I just talked to Nell recently. So, oh. yeah. But did I know Nelly? Okay, because I got to go back in order for people to understand the, the dynamics. Did I know Nell at that time? Okay, well check this out. 
when I met Neil, I met him in, in 1993. 1993, remember when I told you my homeboy, Misfit, who was in a group with me? Well, yep. Tar Boy from Track Boys, who produced Jaquan, hit single, everybody in the club getting tipsy, he stayed around yep. the corner from Misfit. We used to always be over his house. That was our homeboy. Like, we used to roll with him, like, almost every day. Tar Boy from Track Boys. One day we was over his house, these four dudes came over there. We used to always be trying to get beats from them. Tall Boy used to produce back then. He didn't take it that serious, but he made beats and he rapped. So we would be over Tall Boy house trying to get beats from him. And these four dudes came over. They were trying to get beats from him and they was rapping. Well, these four dudes just so happened to be uh, Nelly, Murphy Lee, Kiwan, and City Spud. This was in 93. That's how I met them. Me, Kiwan, and City Spud always stayed in contact after that. I didn't really know Nelly. Murphy Lee was cool too, that's Kiwan's brother. We didn't stay in contact, but I would see Murph and speak and we'd chat. But me, Kiwan, and City Spud stayed in contact. That with our warning album, City Spud produced five tracks off of that. He produced like Whoa. five tracks, yeah. We was working together. Okay. But Nelly, I didn't know like that. I just met him that day. And this is when they all rapped fast. Like they was like bone, like rap like bone type of rap. They all rapped fast. He hadn't became to that style that he that he have. He rapped fast at this point. That's when I met Nelly. Over the years, when we was working on it without, and I'm just going back a little bit so people can get an understanding. Um, I used to be with Spud. I'll be with Spud a lot. And I'll go up to the studio where they would be recording sometimes, and you know they'd be in there recording. Nelly didn't know who I was, you know what I'm saying? So he did, he couldn't he couldn't really say, oh that was Chingy then, because he didn't know know who I was. But I would be up there sometime with Spud, just messing around when they was with D2, and recording at Saints. Fast forward to when before Nelly got his deal, me and Spud was about to start working on my project spud just so happens to get locked up and go to jail if you ever heard nelly tell a story of how when he him and city spud went to new york right to right before the deal and and all that to work then they come back to st louis when, when spud came back to st louis me and him would be working together around this time like like i say but i don't really know nelly at this time but me and Spud would be working together. And Spud used to be like, man, we working on something. And when this shit go through, I'm pulling you in. I'd be like, all right, yeah, all good. Woo -doo -woo -woo. That was my homeboy. But Spud ended up getting locked up. Spud ended up getting locked up right when Nelly blew. Got you. Right Got when you. Nelly blew. Spud ended up getting locked up. And then they shot off. But I never really knew. And oh, I I'm forgetting. Ali from the St. Lunatics. His younger brother, Ahmad, been my best friend since we were six. We've we been real good friends since I was, we were six. And so I know Ali too. So this is still, it, it all is connected. You know what I mean? But I just, I didn't know Nelly personally like that, but everybody else I kind of had a relationship with. Okay, understood. Okay, thanks for breaking that down. Because... He you know, both of those guys, Nelly and Chris, Ludacris, yeah. they go on to do numbers. Great things. Um, they make their mark in this hip-hop thing. Great um, things. Just in entertainment and pop culture in general. They killed the game. Yeah. I'm going to tell you something. I don't mean to go cut ahead. you off, but like, like I told you, I talked to them. I just talked to them recently. Um, and, you know, I kind of made a, a vow to... I don't like discussing the the beef part of that for real, the mm -hmm. previous mm -hmm. beef stuff, I, because it's just a a, a a imbalanced energy that I feel that we all let die. I don't mind talking about the situation, but I just don't because I, I don't like to shed light on a, a wound that's closed. Understood. You know what I mean. Understood. Yeah, but no, we can definitely talk about it. I, I'm not. I don't mind yeah, talking sure. about. 
you know, how things happen, get with disturbing the peace and a lot of stuff. But yeah, I don't like to talk about the beef side and what all of that, all of that stuff. That's absolutely fine, brother. You know, and again, I was really trying to get to you wind up signing with disturbing the peace. Disturbing the peace. As yep. opposed to signing with dirty, which most people would think you would have got it like soon as um Nelly blew up, he'd have came back and snuck snatched you right up after him. Okay, so it's a story to that. You a lot of people, Go a ahead. lot of people don't know certain things that went on behind the scenes. So I'm gonna share, I'm gonna share something with everybody. Now, in 2000, 99, 2000, when Nelly Blue, keep in mind, I told you I was best friends at, when we were six with Ali's younger brother, um, MOD. Yes. MOD is on the road with um, Ali and them, you know, just doing road stuff. When he come back home, we'll be in the studio just creating music. I was at this time I'm not with without warning. I'm I'm solo. So we'll be creating music in the studio and then me and MOD, we made some songs. And we was like, um, man, these songs sound good. You know what? Let's make some more. So we made some more group songs. Then we like, you know what? Psh, let's let you wanna try to do this little, little group thing? And so we was like, right, cool, let's do it. So we called ourselves three strikes. We made like 40 records. We had a lot of records. So these records, Ali Hurm, T Love, nail manager at the time, these are all friends. So T Love heard the songs and like, damn, that shit sound good. T Love wanted to manage us. So we like, cool, love, you can manage us. So this is how in 2000, 2001, they needed somebody to open up. Nail went on this run, the lunatics went on this run they need somebody to open the shows. T Love got us to open the shows. So we opening the shows, doing a great job. Um, it's a, we on the gang of shows, two day spot dates. I mean, 10,000 seaters. You know what I'm saying? 10,000 seaters. You know, Nail was number that, one. That ain't the, a bad he was number show one in this time. So it was big. It was big. Yeah. And we was getting a great look. So, and, we, and we appreciated that. Now, keep in mind, listen to me, because this is 2000, 2001. To keep that in mind. Um, I remember one time coming off, they coming off the road, Yella, who was, who was Nelly's road manager at the time, he had a little gathering over at his house. So we went over there. And everybody just chilling. We just chilling, everybody talking, you know, kicking it, drinking, woo 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 me and Three Strikes was in the kitchen. We just in there talking. So Nell happened to walk in. <laughs> I, and I could, I could never forget this because this is exactly how it happened. Nell happened to walk in and he was just like, he was like, I'll sign you, but I ain't, I would, I ain't sign, I wouldn't sign them. And he said this. <laughs> mm. <laughs> and it was, I was just like, damn. But you know, I was in the group. I was like, I, you know, I ain't going to just leave. You know, I'm in a group, so I can't really just. But he just came in there and said that we talked for a minute. And then, you know, everybody, we was just mingling, you know, drinking and mingling. But he did come in there and say that. And But but nothing happened. But we still was opening up the shows with him and, you know, and all of that. T-Love. Go ahead. No, you know, I, I didn't want to cut because you're giving us a lot of great information. Mm -hmm. I was trying to get to. How did you even get cool with Shaka Zulu? That's why let me go. Okay, let go me go ahead. there. I got you. I got okay. you. That's why I said, keep in mind when I say 2001. That's why I was saying that. So this is 2001. This is going on with the three uh -huh. strikes thing with the, with the situation. Um, T. Love ended up, I forgot. He ended up, he not managing us no more at this point. You know what I'm saying? We just moving and grooving. And eventually, the group Three Strikes, we all kind of, we all was friends. And I, my, our homeboy won. We added him to the group. So it was three of us. We all was friends, but things wasn't working out between the group like we wanted. So we all kind of did all the separate thing at this point. 
This is this is around. Now we going into 2002. Summer of right summer or beginning of summer 2002. Sham from the track stars who produced my who produced right there and everything. Mm -hmm. Sham used to be in the group out of order. Remember, I was talking about certain groups in the beginning who was around. Yep. Sham yep. is one of those dudes in the group out of order who was around. I, that's how I knew him. He producing with his partner Zo. This is 2002 to summer. He like, man, you should come over, check out some beats and see what we got. We, I, I, I never forget because we seen him at a gas station. Me and my homeboys was about to fight these little dudes at this gas station. Some of the dudes thought they was tough and talking crazy. It was just funny because we about to get into a fight and then we see Sham. And then I see Sham, we connect, get his number. He want me to come check out some beats and stuff. So I said, all right. And so I, I called him. I went over there, I'll never forget. Um, this little bitty apartment that Zoe lived in. And they popped the beat CD in. First beat that came off was right there beat. And I was like, I got something to that. Go to the next one. First beat. First beat was right there beat. Very first beat. Now me, I'm, I, I'm very, I was very used to just writing. I didn't have to have a track, but I knew what I wanted to hear when I heard a track. I knew what my song was about, and I knew when I heard a beat, if it went to it or not. That beat came on, I was like, yep, I got something to that. And I was talking about right there. Now right there, I wrote the, the hook in the first verse in 96. This is 2002. So I had been had that. They played some more beats and I'm like, yeah, no, I got something to this, this and that. We listened to the BCD. Next step, this the summer. Now we going into September. Next step, now I'm over Zo house, kind of living there. We there every day, me and Sham, sleeping. I'm sleeping on the couch, slam, Sham on the floor, sleeping on the futon. All we doing is eating Emo's pizza, watching Baby Boy, and recording. <laughs> That's all we doing, September. So, Zoe was in a band called Shea Vegas. He would be going to play in his band. He played the keyboard. So when you heard One Call Away and Holiday Inn and all that, you heard them, them, them keyboards and Zoe, that's Zoe getting down on that. Cause he was really, uh -huh. he's really good with that. And so, but me and Sham was the foundation. Me and Sham would be sitting in that apartment. We'll get us something to eat, watch Baby Boy. We'll go in that room. Sham would get on that, that, that MPC. He'll just start and I'll be right there. That's how Holiday Inn came about. Sham was hitting that. And I'll be right there. I, it's this girl I was talking to at the time, happened to be over there this day. I was like, come here, <laughs> say, what you doing? <laughs> and she say, what you doing? I'll be like, nothing chilling at the Holiday Inn. I'll be like, say, who you with? she said, say, who you with? Me and my peace want to bring forward yo. That's how Holiday Inn came about. That's how oh. mostly all them songs came about. A lot of them. A lot of them songs came about organically like that, but some of them I already had. Now we talking about October. So do you remember when Ludacris was on that anger management tour with Eminem? Absolutely. This is around the time. Sham already had a, a connection on Ch Chaka Zulu. So he told them, he told them when he come in town to come up to the uh, concert. We went up to the concert when they got in town. Back, we was backstage. To this day, it's a video. They probably didn't even know it was me. Big Jeff, one of the CEOs of Disturbing the Peace, who's a great, who's like yep. an uncle to me now. He um, had Jeff me Dixon. rapping on the camera. I, I'm sure he didn't know it was me at the time. I mean, when I became Ching, I know he didn't know that. But I was rapping on the camera. We was back there. That's what I met um, Sean. I met everybody. Met Chris. But at this time, nobody knows who I am. October, or, or when it was in St. Louis around that time, I believe October, some something like that. So, met Chaka Zulu, sent a CD off with right there on it and a couple more records. Sent it to uh, I think. Universal, I think they sent it to Warner or Sony or somebody, but we also sent it to Shaka. Shaka got it, 
I had right there on there with just a verse and a hook. Shaka got it said, tell him to finish that song. Shaka pinpointed that. Uh. Yes, Shaka's great, brilliant. He said, tell him to finish that song. Y'all get it put on vinyl, get it mixed and mastered, and then give it to me. <laughs> so we finished it, mixed and mastered, vinyl, get the Shaka. This is October, November. December, I had my deal with Capitol Records, DTP slash Capitol Records, December 14th. Next year, right there was the number one record in the country. And that's how that happened. Damn. Yo, shout to Shaka Zulu. Um, first and foremost, a damn good brother. Shout to all them dudes over there. Jeff yeah. Dixon, Sean Taylor, yeah. the whole crew. Yeah, Sean, yep. Yeah. Yeah, show, show him my brother. Like, the, these are all great guys. Every single one of them. You know, before we even move the interview on, obviously, uh, you, like everybody in the music industry, in the entertainment, knows that Shaka was recently shot. Um, yeah, I was caught devastated. Caught all of us off guard. I was super devastated. I was super I can imagine. devastated. I heard that shit. I was super devastated. You know what I'm saying? I was really devastated. Yeah. Yeah. One of the most unlikely people that you would ever expect, you know, to hear something like that from beautiful guy. So uh, wishing him a speedy recovery. Yeah, he's recovering too. He's good. Yeah, he's doing good. Yep. Question for you. Right there. Where did that name come from? What, what, where did that right title there? even like? Y yep. Well, where that came from is that's how we talk in St. Louis. Especially in the in the inner city. That's how we talk. It's like I can't even say there. Like it sounds strange to me even trying to say it. Like, oh, oh, I'll be over there. Like I, I can't say it. Because I'm so used to saying it how I say it. There. Like I can't say it the <laughs> I guess the regular way. But um that's how we talk in St. Louis. Like I say, especially in the city, especially in the inner city, that's how we talk. So it ain't nothing that was made up. It ain't nothing that somebody said, oh, you know, we're going to say it like this and pronounce it like this and then get something going and make it a fad. No, nah, ain't nothing like that. That's how I talk. That's part of Chinglish, my new album. That's all part of Chinglish. Got you. Uh, you know, I work with a lot of artists in my career, and some of them work their whole career to get a hit record. You came out the gate with a certified monster. Like you literally came out, obviously people in your hometown, your backyard, St. Louis, they knew you, you doing your thing. But the world came to know Chingy yeah. were right there. Like how did it feel, how, right now, you, at that point, what are you like 21, 22 20, years old? 22, 22 going on 23. How does it feel going from a local artist who's struggling to be heard to dropping this record? It goes number two on the Billboard, not the rap charts, but the Billboard Hot 100 chart. You you done crossed over. You yeah. went mainstream. Yeah, yeah. You, as, as big as they could. Like, how does that feel for a 22-year-old man? And how did life change for you almost overnight? So how did that feel as a 22-year-old man? First off, I want to say shout out to who's my DJ, DJ Snow, because DJ Snow was the first one planted in St. Louis, and he became my DJ. So shout out to DJ Snow and the rest of the DJs too. But um, I just want to say something real quick um, for us right there go. Like when we came up in St. Louis um, doing music, you couldn't sound like nobody. So, so when you're hearing the Nellies, the Cheese, and everybody coming out of St. Louis, we grew up and came up, you couldn't sound like nobody. You couldn't go around your partners. You couldn't go around nobody sounding like nobody else. It wasn't respected. You always had that to be you. That was the cardinal sin. That was the cardinal sin in rap music. That was you, the cardinal you, sin you get, mm -hmm. in rap music. And we stuck to that. You couldn't sound like nobody. Me, in an early age... When I was like, remember I told you I was a battle rapper? Yes. I wanted to yes. get on the radio. I wanted to get on the radio. That was my whole thing. How do I get on the radio? So I started transitioning 
on how to learn how to make catchy hooks for the radio. Then when I found out how to make catchy hooks for the radio, that stuck. And I said, you know what? That's what I'm going to do. So right there is a product, is, is, a, is, one, is a main product from that era when that's how I was thinking. I was thinking about just making catchy stuff. But when I made right there and when it became a success, I didn't know, I didn't know it was going to become a success. I was just making music. I just was, I had a goal, I had a dream. I was like, I'm, I'm just trying to move forward to my, to accomplish my dream. And that was to make it in the industry. You know what I'm saying? But it blew up, it blew up so big. A lot of people thought it was an overnight success because they didn't know me. They looking at it like, oh, here's this kid just coming out of nowhere. I didn't yes. just come out of nowhere. You know what I'm saying? You just got to do a little research and do a little, you know, see see where i came from and how and how you know what my what my journey looked like but they thought i came out of nowhere man i've ran into i've ran into artists who i was inspired by older wiser artists and everything who who looked down on me because of that because it took them when they came out they had to grind to get a hit some some people they had to grind to get a hit or two i came out with many three. artists did I came out with three back to back from my first project. So when you, so when, so when these people, like once again, I tell people all the time, and I and I'll use me and Nelly as example. You don't conform to what's trendy and what's a fad and what's going on. Be you. Always stand out. Stars stand out. Sure, you can be popular. You can, you know what I'm saying? If you want to be popular, go ahead, sound like everybody else, be a fad, be a trend. If you want to just be popular and blend in. But stars stand out. They still there even when the blue skies is up. You see them at night, but they still there when the blue skies there. Stars stand out. People like us was real big on standing out and being an outcast. And that's what we did. Such great advice, such great advice. And I pray that um, young artists, uh, people who are trying to get into the art, so in business in general, that they mm -hmm. really take heed to what you said. Yeah, you know, it's 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 easy to try to clone what's already out there. We see it a lot today. Sure, we do. Yeah, there, there's it's very easy to do that. It's it's difficult to be. You would think the easiest thing in the world would be to just be yourself, so just, just be, be yourself. authentic, be an original. Yeah. But that is so difficult and people are always trying to rush to the finish line. Yeah. And they try to get there by doing what's popular, what's already acceptable, um, what's already proven, mm -hmm. instead of just saying, you know what? I can be a better version of me mm -hmm. than be a secondhand version of something that's already out there. Yeah. Because, because... You don't you don't want to just take what somebody doing and replicate it. You want to you want to say, OK, that's what's going on. All right. Let me make that mine. And this is how I'll do it. You know what I'm saying? This this is how I'll do that. If I'm going to do it, this is how I'll do it. Don't just say, oh, I'm going to do it just like this. You know what I mean? So they consider right there. It's, it's dance music. It went pop. Like you said, it crossed over soon as I came out. That we sent that to Urban. It went to Urban. Soon as it went to Urban, it started crossing over mainstream and everywhere. But see, that's a product of when I make music, I'm not making music saying, oh, I'm making this for Urban Radio. Oh, I'm making this for Pop Radio. Nah, I'm making this for everybody around this world in this existence who just love music. I don't care if you're Asian. I don't care if you're European. I don't care if you of Indian descent or whatever the case may be. I just want everybody to enjoy some good music. And that's why everybody loved it. Yeah, you know, speaking of, of, of really creating great music, I mean, your, your, your first album, Jackpot, th that was just great music. I mean, you got you got the single. You you spoke about it earlier. Yeah, 
You was like, yeah, I had three back to back to back. I had three of them. Jo- you and had, had more. one call away. I, exactly. But I'm just talking about your singles right yep. there. One call away, holiday, killing it. Um, you know, the jackpot album it had, you know, Ludacris, Snoop Dogg, um, St. Louis own Murphy Lee, yep. Titty Boy back yep. then, but had we 20. know him as Two Chains. Trina, you had Jermaine Dupri, album went multi-platinum. You killed yes. the game. Yeah. I, I, I want to talk to you Another about- Another story. I don't mean to cut Go you ahead. off. Because see, it's just certain things that's dear to my heart that when I was a kid, I had plans on, I had dreams to accomplish. When I was 13, I made Chris Kelly rest in paradise. I love Chris Cross. If anybody, if you knew me as a kid, you know I loved crisscross, And you knew that one day I wanted to work with Jermaine Dupri. I used to go to Atlanta looking for Jermaine Dupri. Like, real talk. So when... You talk about manifestation. So when you're able to have a number one record with this man, with Pulling Me Back featuring Tyrese, that was a number one record for six weeks. That's a dream come true. And... I always wanted to work with Jermaine Dupri. I just had to say that. I just had to say that. Nah, beautiful, beautiful. Uh, I want to talk about your second single for a second. Um, the one call away joint. How did one call away was second? Was that second? No, that was third. That was second. That was the third single. That came after Holiday. It came after Holiday Inn. Yep. Got you. Got you. Okay, so. Th- th- and I want to go to one call away j- just because I remember in the music video, yep. you you had Rudy, Lil Rudy, yep. Keisha Knight Polian from from um from the Cosby, Cosby show. show. Yep. And I remember you having her in the video as your love interest. Yep. And I think it was the first time all of us had seen Lil Rudy all grown Wrong. up. That was the point. So that was the point once again. Chaka Zulu. That was the point. But see, we knew her her brother, JP, was a friend of Disturbing the Peace and still works with Chris to this day. That's his sister. Chaka thought it would be a good look to get Rudy as the love interest. And, and listen, I used to think Rudy was my girlfriend when I was young, like watching comedy <laughs> shows. I used to literally think that was my girlfriend. So to have her in the video playing my love interest while everybody get to see her while she this blossomed young lady, it was beautiful. Mm-hmm. You couldn't, mm-hmm. going, going, let me tell you, it, was, it wasn't a better way to set up three records. Going from right there. Now, what I will always credit myself, my first record was just me. And that's my biggest record. And it's just me. Mm. No features. It's yep. just me. Yep. That tell you a lot about how I get down with my music. Going to Holiday Inn. I wanted Chris and Snoop Dogg on there. I saw that vision for that. I wanted them on that record. Then you, you got Ludacris and Snoop Dogg on that. Then you go to One Call Away, you got beautiful Rudy. It just was such... Sh- Shaka Zulu played a major part in this. Like, this dude is brilliant. It was just such a... Uh, it was it was so dynamic in how everything was put together and presented. That's what made everybody play their part in that project. That's why I was so successful. Because everybody played their part and played it damn well. Rudy, she played it damn well. We made it look really good. You know what yeah. I mean? And so I'm just proud of it. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. But we also, like Chingy Jackpot, when we shot One Call Away, we shot a video for my record, Chingy Jackpot. Chingy, why your eyes so chinky? That post been a fourth single. We was finna try to, we was finna try to ride that album out. Mm-hmm. But then, then things started to change. Going into okay, my, going into my second that. album. I gotta ask you that. Because you speak so highly, um, and you really do speak with with endearment when speaking about uh, the whole crew over at Disturbing the Peace. Yeah, you're only one album in. Yeah, what could possibly have changed? Because y'all go from 
making this incredible album, um, putting out monster hits, and then you're not on a label. Mm -hmm. What what happened? Okay, so what happened in the situation with the Disturbing the Peace breakup, now, throughout my first album and throughout this whole, the whole journey, which I wasn't complaining because things were going great. I never had my, I never had an own lawyer. I never had a lawyer, my own lawyer. So, I mean, a lot of people would tend to say, well, well, that's not good. I never had my own lawyer. Okay, maybe I'm, uh, just, just, for the, just for the sake of this conversation you and I are having, I, how, do you, how do you have a multi-platinum album and not have a lawyer? That, I, that, I was using, how, how does I was that using even happen? Chaka lawyers. I was using Disturbing the Peace lawyers. So, so it seems, it, it seems like a, acting. Yeah. So it seems like conflict of interest or something. Somebody, you, people may think, but okay. listen, let me tell you. I, I used to go with Shaka to the lawyer office. So I'm not here to say nobody was doing nothing foul because he had me around. You know what I'm saying? As a young kid, matter of fact, I don't even know. I'm, I, I can't tell you if I needed a lawyer or not, I don't know. I just knew things were going great. I'm doing what I love to do. My, in my personal bank account, I got hundreds of thousands of dollars. I'm making money. I got accounts over here. Life is great. I left the business to Chaka Zulu, who was handling it, right? I left the business to him. He handled business. That's what he did. He got it done and he got it done. So, my mother, may she rest in paradise, she thought I needed my, a, a lawyer for myself. So she went and got this lawyer, I ain't gonna say his name, but he was from St. Louis. Cool, I'm like, it, man, the type of young guy I was, I literally, if, if somebody was trying to help me, I, I didn't mind. But sometimes people can act like they're trying to help you just to get on the inside and try to do something dirty to you. But my mother, Correct. But my mother got this lawyer, and after a while, when he went over the contracts and everything, this is who starts saying disturbing the peace was stealing from me. Not me. I never said that. The lawyer made that statement. I always said that from when it happened. So this is, this is real. So then a meeting was called. Chaka Zulu, everybody came to St. Louis, the accountants, everybody. With this lawyer that I had and round table, Chaka was like, have I ever done this to you? I was like, no, 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 nobody's ever done them wrong. I, you know, I, I'm confused. I don't, keep in mind too, I am 23, I have no fucking clue, excuse my language, about this business. All I know is making videos, creating my music, and that I'm living my dream and nothing's going wrong to me in my eyes. And Shaka them, Shaka is like a god at this point to me. Like literally, he, Shaka is like an Egyptian god to me. That's how I look at him. Because I come from a place where I never thought I would make it in such a way. And because of him, he'll save me. But because he noticed my talents, here I am in this position. So I looked at him as a guy. But when we left that meeting, communication just slowly broke apart. People was busy, people doing this. And, and communication just slowly broke apart. After that, I was I was more confused than anything. Like I was confused walking around. Like I was totally confused because I didn't know what was really going on. I didn't get why the lawyer said what he said. I didn't get why he said they were stealing from me. Now, when you tell a 23-year-old kid, somebody he's looking at like, look up to that's like a God and, and everybody, you tell them, oh, they stealing from you. Now the kid is confused. I'm confused. I'm like, huh? 
what you mean you're stealing from me? I don't get it. We, we having the best time of our lives. Everything is great. He said they were stealing from me. So things just slowly started to slow down and communication slowly started to stop to where that was the breakup. I went into my fourth album, Powerballing, which was a great album, and that was just me with Capital. Capital. Hold on, we, we, we talking second album, Powerball. I mean, damn, my, my bad. Second album, Powerball. Okay. My bad. Yep, second album, yep, Powerball, yep. and went into Without Disturbing the Peace. Now, keep in mind, Capital didn't know how to work it like Disturbing the Peace. And that's why the outcome was not like the first album. You see what I'm saying? I came out, don't get me wrong. I absolutely see what you're saying. I, I, I got a question for you, and I'm, and I'm sorry to interject. Because I know Shaka uh, very well, Jeff, Sean, all of those guys. They're actually, they're, they're, they're frat brothers of mine. These are men of integrity. Good guys. Yeah. Um, you getting off the label, it's very difficult for, for artists to get off a label, to break a contract. Once this misunderstanding came about, did they, you know, hey, if you don't want to be here, if you believe these allegations, you know what? We'll let you walk. Me and Jeff talked in Miami. Okay. I'll never forget it. But keep in mind, I'm I'm, man, I'm a confused kid. I was a confused kid. Like I was a kid. I was confused. I didn't know what was going on. You know, so I didn't really know how to deal. I didn't know how to really go about it when it came to business. I didn't know that business. That's why I had them. You know what I mean? So it, all was in my head was, why did this lawyer say they stole from me? So I'm confused. So when we talked, it was just we talked and everything was good. But things never meshed back together because Big Jeff was like, man, what we need to do to fix it? What we need to what you want? But I didn't know how to talk to Jeff about no business and about like that. I didn't know. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, I mean, we was good. Everything was cool. But I just I just I'm, I wasn't a, I was an artist. I wasn't a business man that got like now to be it's different. Then, man, I was a kid. You know. No, I totally understand, and, and that's the reason why I said what I said. These are these are gentlemen of the highest integrity that I know of. And and I can't imagine them not sitting you down and saying, How can we fix this? What's wrong? Like, so be it as it may, I appreciate you telling the story. Let's move on. Powerball, Powerball yep. and drops. Drop. You have R. Kelly, Bun B, Lil Wayne, Lil Flip, Janet Jackson, David Banner, um, Nate Dogg. You yeah. had all kind of people yeah. on that album. I, I, I got to ask, just for, just for my own knowledge, you've seen what happened to R. Kelly in recent years. Number one, when, when you made the song with R. Kelly, was y'all in the studio together? And number two, are you even surprised about how his life has turned out? Okay, so listen, let me tell you something. When we talk manifest, let me tell you something. One time, I forgot where we was at. We was out of town. I want to say Minneapolis, Minnesota, something, but I ain't sure. I, me and my road manager at the time was in this mall. We were, we were talking about how we wanted to get R. Kelly on that song. Would you believe we was walking in this store, and guess who was walking in with us? Get out of here. I can't make this up. My road manager will tell you. We was talking about getting him on the song, that song. We was walking into the store. He and like two other people was walking in. And then that's when I told him. It was the most craziest thing. Like seriously. And... Well, what you said about how his life panned out in this situ that situation, very unfortunate. Very, 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 very unfortunate. People tend to get a little too serious about that topic with him and what's going on. I'm not going to touch on all of that. I will say this. I've been around him in clubs and VIPs and everything with women, around him with women. 
I've only seen him be respectful to women. My personal experience. I've only seen him be respectful to women and have fun with women. And guess what? Older women. Women who had to, women I watched them checking IDs and doing everything for them to come around us. So all the other stuff I don't know about. I just know about what my experience is and when I was around an individual. Did you actually get to work with him in the studio or did he do his lyrics somewhere else and fly him in? So how that happened with R. Kelly, I was at my house, I remember. I did my parts. I had somebody, I had somebody kind of seeing how he would, I wanted him to do it and sent it to him. He did it, sent it back even better. <laughs> so that's how we did that. Got you. <laughs> and that's now, that's R. Kelly. That's one story. I got another one. Same Powerball and album. Um, and you do realize, okay, I came out with Baller Baby. The first single was Baller Baby with just me. Then I came out with the remix with Lil Flip. And that was around the time him and T.I. was beefing. Him and T.I. had his beef going on. <laughs> and I remember I would see T.I. around and, you know, we T.I. cool. And it would just be one of the things like, you know, what's up? Because <laughs> I knew, because of they beef <laughs> going on, it got, it was a little worried. And then that was the time he was kind of, him and Chris was kind of going at it too. So it was a lot of stuff going on. Janet Jackson. So, of course, Janet Jackson, icon, Michael Jackson, icon, may rest in paradise. I wanted Janet Jackson on that song. And um, so through Capitol Records and through Kenneth Creer, we made that happen. So one time I was at the studio recording, Larrabee Studios. They said, Chingy, call on line one. I'm like, who the hell calling me at the studio? I pick up the phone and you hear this soft voice. Hello, Chingy, how are you? <laughs> it's Janet Jackson. So I'm about to piss <laughs> on myself. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, what the, what the hell? She like, I love the record. I just love that song and I did. And I appreciate you for having me on it and just wanting me on a part of it. I was like, get the hell out of here. This is Janet Jackson I'm talking to on the phone telling me she appreciated. it. So Kenneth Creer, who was her manager at the time, he used to be like, you know, Janet Jackson loves you. She's always talking about how fine you are. She's always talking about how cute you are. She just thinks you're cute as a button and this, this, and that. I was like, get the fuck out of here. Are you serious? <laughs> he, almost <laughs> made me, he almost made me flirt with Janet. I was like, really? But that's a story. I mean, you know, a lot of people don't have no, can't say that, you know, about Janet Jackson, you know. And so that's just a really, really cool um, story. Nate Dogg. I remember Nate Dogg coming to the studio with me and David Banner. We was Larrabee. That's where I worked at. Um, Nate Dogg came in and he laid his part uh, for, for the song. Back one more again, this Nate Dogg. May he rest in paradise. David Banner, man. Um, Yeah, man, I appreciate every Bun B. I used to go and hang with Bun B and them down in Houston. You know, and I remember when Pimp C got out of jail, we had a show. And Pimp C came to me say, hey, Chingy, that, that, that Dem Jeans, that was his shit in jail. That's what he said. My song, Dem Jeans with Jermaine Dupri, said that was my shit in jail, Chingy. We got to do something. And Pimp C was like one of my, one of my I was very inspired by Pimp C in the South. I had, you had Easy on the West. You had Pimp C in the South. When it came to me and who I liked, that's how it was. And if you ever pay attention to the voices, you could tell. If you listen to Pimp C's high mm -hmm. voice, easy voice, listen to my voice, you'll be able to see it. But yeah, Power Ball yeah. was a was like a it. it still went platinum. I think like double platinum now, I ain't sure, but I think it is. That album was a very underrated album. That was a hot, it was a hot project. I mean, it, it, the album did well. It, it did. It for sure was a platinum album. For sure was a platinum album. Could be double platinum now. I mean, it peaked at number 10 on the charts. Mm -hmm. I mean, this was by no means 
a flop. You didn't have a dud on your hand. Like, no, you, I didn't. You were still We a only certified. came out with one single. That's it. The Baller Baby and then the remix. We didn't come out with no other records. Got you. Yeah, well, Lil Wayne was on the album, um, 26s. Very influential in my career. I've been, I've been paying attention to Lil Wayne since he was an underground artist, Guerrilla Warfare and all that. I've been known, known about Lil Wayne. So he, he's, one of, he's one of them guys when it come to me too. Yeah, Lil Wayne is that dude. I've been paying attention to him since he was a kid. Okay, um, right around this time, you know, and, and again, I, I heard you loud and clear early in the interview. We don't want to bring up um, old bad energy, but I got to ask you because it's part of your story. Yep. And I don't think I was ever clear. You know, you and um, Nelly... Saint Lunatics, y'all. I mean, and I don't even know if I want to call it beef because it it never felt. Obviously, there was some tension there, but how how did it go from Nelly walking in the crib one day, long before you are the Nelly that we known you to come and and dominate the rap charts? How did it go from that to y'all having any kind of problem? I'll say, I'll say this. How I go from that to having any kind of problem? I'll say this. It was it was certain people that was in certain people er uh, about that was starting stuff. Certain people was just starting stuff. Um, drugs being involved, you know, people people having, you know, saying their mind ain't in the right place. And so they choosing to go about certain things in this type of way instead of having a conversation and talking like grown men. They choosing to they choosing to um, show aggression and cause conflict, and and getting in other people' ear to allow them to feel a certain way. Mm -hmm. And that's how that kind of started going because N Nelly wasn't on that, I don't believe, but other people getting people ears. And and when you feel like this my home, this my people, I got to ride with them. You, you mm. see what I'm saying? I don't, I'm not trying to be too, go over into it too much, but do you get what I'm saying? I do. I do. But where, and I'll tell you this though, where I felt like he had a problem with me is on his album Sweatsuit when he said, I like the way you do that right there. You just remember why you do that right there. That's when I was, that's when I questioned it and said, okay, he must got a problem with me. Okay, so, so, and this is why I said, I don't even know if I could call this beef because you are Chingy. You got a song right there. It was getting heated in the I'm street in St. Louis. So it was. Okay, so that yeah, must be, no, that no, must no, be no, something yeah. different because me hearing that vocal, I don't take that personal. I don't. Yeah. I, at, mo at, 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 at most, maybe he, he gave you a little jab, maybe a little slight yeah, like, but if, if if you know who this, the big homie is. But, but, but. I, that's not how I see it. Ain't no big homie in me and all of that. That I wasn't on that. That ain't no, you know what I'm saying? Like, ain't no, uh -huh. nah. Uh -huh. But just to, just to, just to say this, and because I don't want to go into, like, like that, we, that's not a we problem. good. Like, we are good. Um, if you paid attention to the whole song, see, Neil could be strategic. The whole, the song was called It Ain't Another One. So you have to pay attention to the whole thing. The song is called It Ain't Another One. And in this record, he chose to, me, he chose to, that's when he chose to say something to me. That spoke, that's what spoke to me. It ain't another one. So basically, dude, listen here. It's not another one. Get on.
<laughs> That's how I looked at Got it. Got you. That's Got how you. I looked at it. And I would ask people around me, is this a shot? Or is it not? I would ask people. But even then, I didn't diss them. I didn't take it. I didn't really, I didn't take it nowhere, to be honest. But like I said, Nail is, we, I just talked to him recently. Everything is great. That's why I say I don't like to bring these things, keep, you know, because people look at stuff and may take stuff and why he say that or I just want, I don't, I want that energy to be over. My brother, and, and to be quite honest, I'm with you. Um, you know, there's certain questions that have to be asked because they're part of your story. No, I get it. No, and, I get it. Don't get me wrong. You know, the, yeah, the, 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 the 100%. So we can switch topics. I got, and I'm hoping, and I think I know the answer to this. Uh, you know, I got a question just in terms of y'all ever having a dialogue, ever sitting down and saying, you know what? We've been going through some nonsense and it ain't even clear why. Have y'all two as grown men ever just sat down? Um, I know you spoke to him the other day, but just having a, like, why are we even doing this? We from the same place. It should be us actually, working together as opposed to working against each other. Actually, we've FaceTimed and, you know, we, we've discussed it, but we pretty much, when we talk, we move past it. We Understood. don't allow it to linger. We move past it, move forward. He'll, he, he'll get me on some performances with him or, you know, we move, we've, we've moved past that. And he don't really, he don't like to backtrack to it. So he don't like to talk about mm -hmm. it. He don't talk about it. Didn't, didn't he bring you out on stage with him during the Scream tour or something like that back in the days? Bow Wow brought, you want, you want to know what's funny? That's kind of when it ended. Go ahead. That's kind of when it ended. On the Scream tour, Bow Wow brought me and him out on stage. And that's when that really ended. Uh, yeah. So Bow was a part of ending this thing. He probably didn't know it. I don't think he knew it. I don't think he really, really knew it, knew it. But he knew the tension that was going on. But when, but that night, I had my son with me. Nail had his kids with him. His kids were excited to see me. My son was excited to see him. Bow. It, it was strange. But I'm going I'm to be honest with you. I came there with the mind frame when I saw him, like, I ain't speaking to that nigga. Like, that's, that's what my mind frame was, because this was going on. This was going so on So you still. knew he was going to be there. You knew he was going to be on that, that, that particular yeah. show. This was okay. going on. It still was going on. And that's where my mind was. But I quickly killed my ego when, end of that night, when the things went the way they went. And that's really when it, Died down. Beautiful. Yeah, Beautiful. I don't even like. To, okay. I, I ain't gonna. I'll be honest. I don't like talking about. It. I like because <laughs> I just don't. No, you know, it's, okay. it's just one of those things you want to be just gone. It's like mm -hmm. it's behind me so much. I just, but I, I, I get where you're coming from. You say that is a part of your story. Correct. Okay. Let's move on to your third album. You know, another album, you had some great collaborations on it. Jermaine Dupri, you know, this is somebody who you've been looking up to and wanting to work with and had another chance to work with him. Timbaland, Manny Fresh, yep. um, all contributed to that album. It debuted at number eight on the Billboard charts, mm -hmm. went gold. Yeah. But it, coming off of multi-platinum albums, you know. Gold. I know people, people would give their right arm to, to get a gold record, like, like a yeah. gold album, not yeah. a gold single, a gold album. Yeah. Did you feel like, damn, like I only went gold or was you still thankful for the, op I'm, I'm still selling gold records out here. I still was thankful because I mean, like you just said, it's still a gold album. And yes. We released Pull Me Back, we released um, Them Jeans. But what you got to realize is this. Remember when I told you when Disturbing the Peace was, when I was with them and we was with Capital, Jackpot 
did what it did because of us planning and putting together and working hard. And I'm talking about not just capital, I'm talking about disturbing the peace and me and us, we was in the streets, we was going. We was mm-hmm. going. My second album and third album, Disturbing the Peace wasn't there. I'm a kid. I don't know how to do what Shaka's doing, what everybody's doing. I don't know, I don't know how to do that. So I'm working with Capital. Capital was taking Disturbing the Peace lead. I mean, they know they doing certain things too, but Capital was letting Disturbing the Peace do what they needed to do. I think that is a cause of those projects not doing as well either. They did great, mm-hmm. don't get me wrong. Cause you know, I work. Promo tours, everything, I work. So they they gonna do something because I like to work. But Disturbing the Peace was very instrumental in the groundwork. Yes, that's what made those types of labels special. Whether it's Disturbing the Peace, the rapper lots, the bad boys, you know, Rockefeller. You got your majors, but those types of indie labels, they bought something to the table that these major labels just didn't have. They had their finger on the pulse of what was going on in the streets. And they had the streets so much on lock, it was such a value for artists to be signed through them because they could do things that the, the, the majors just couldn't do. Majors could cut a check. Sure, they could cut a bigger check than, than the indies could, but they just didn't necessarily have the, the ground troops on the ground, on the front line, the way that these indies did. You're right. They didn't have the ground troops, and the indies had the ground troops. But something now is on my brain because now something else is speaking, telling me now I have to say this. So, mm-hmm. uh, okay, so going back to the Nelly. I'm going to tell you why I always put the beef off and never wanted it going on and didn't care for it to go on. Remember Nelly's sister, Jackie? She passed from cancer. Of course. Yes, passed of course. from cancer. Well, right before she passed, and I didn't know she had cancer, I seen her in the airport. Now, at this time, usually it's a lot of people around me. At this time, it's just me at this gate. There's no gate agent. It's just me at this gate. She comes from out of nowhere. I know her from when we used to open up the shows with three strikes on a row with Nelly. So Jackie was cool. She came over talking to me. She was like, Chingy, I'm so proud of you. I'm so glad you're doing what you're doing. This is so great. She, guess what she said? She said, don't you worry about my brother. She said, here come off his high horse. Don't you worry about him. You keep doing what you're doing. And then she was like, but I do have a wish. Now, at the time, I'm not, I don't know she has cancer. I'm not looking into it hard. She said she had a wish. Now, somebody that says that they have a wish is something that she knows that I don't know. This is how I'm thinking now after that. It's something she knows that I possibly don't know. That's probably can happen. But she said she had a wish. And she said that wish is for me and him to come together. This is the last time I saw her. After that, she passed away. Mm. So from that, when I heard that, I was like, I have to end this for her. This can't go on. She had a wish for this to happen. She want me and her brother to be cool Mm -hmm. that meant something to me that meant something to me and so i wanted to make sure that that happened and that's why i don't really like talking about it because now that me and him we're we on a we on a good pay we we good her her wish can her wish can come true and i want her wish to just go and live on i don't want to keep bringing it up understood and I feel like she just spoke to me or something because even when you was just talking, that's what was on my mind. I damn near didn't even hear what you said. Got you. Um, wow. An amazing story. 
Okay, you come into your fourth album. Hate it or love it. Yep. I, I tell you, man, the whole everything <laughs> always comes 360. <laughs> you, you, you're back on DT. So, but but I have to tell you how that happened. If we go, I'm about to ask so, you, how okay. did that happen? All right. So go ahead. My third album is we we released Pulling Me Back. We released Them Jeans. I think we was we was, we was gonna do a third single. Did we do it? I don't think we did a third single. No, At you didn't do a third point, single on that. No, it wasn't no third single, right? No. Mm. Nope. At this point, Capitol's kind of going on. They having it's a lot of um a lot of issues going in the building, I guess in different work positions or whatever. So Capitol's kind of going down. And at the time, my lawyer, Ron Sweeney, he noticed this. We noticed he's like, they, the Capitol just having a lot of troubles. But at the same time, I remember being in Vegas. I want to say it was Billboard Awards or something. I remember being in Vegas. I ran into one of my homeboys who was doing some stuff for uh, Disturbing the Peace. Ran into him on the elevator. Shocking them staying in the same hotel. He like, hey, man, I'm with shocking them, man. I think y'all should talk. I'm like, shit, I, that's all good. I don't mind talking to shocking them. I ain't seen him in a while anyway. He like, I'm gonna go, I'm finna go up there right now. Well, yeah, I'm gonna talk to him. So he hit me. Shocker Jeff and Ludacris is already in the room. So they want everybody was good. So I went up to the room. And we we were kind of just discussing and going over what transpired, what parts certain people played, how this happened, stuff like that. But at the end of the day, we talked that out like grown men, and we went out after that. I was kind of, you know, we hanging, hanging around, and the option about going back to disturbing the peace came when me and my lawyer sat down. Capital's in a slump. They're having some real troubles over there. My lawyer like, okay, do you want to renegotiate with Capital and EMI, or do you want to... Disturbing the Peace is um, brought something to the table and with Def Jam. Well, the ultimate thing was at that time, you know what's funny? Birdman was trying to sign me to cash money around this time too. He wanted me to fly to Miami. He wanted to talk to me about signing to cash money. That was funny mm -hmm. around this time. Okay. Um, so Disturbing the Peace, Def Jam, or re -sign with Capital EMI. Me and the lawyer, the lawyer then we thought, it, okay, good idea. Let's let's go with the disturbing peace death jam option. Talked it out. That happened. That's how I signed back with disturbing the peace. But this time it wasn't capital, it was death jam. And so um 2007, that's when Hate of the Lover came out, first single with A Marie, Fly Like Me. A lot of people don't know, but Chris wrote that. I wanted Chris to write that. Chris wrote your part? Chris wrote that record, yeah. I, wa I wanted him to write. See, thing with me, I was trying to work with Chris in a different way. I'm not, I don't care about we getting money and all of that. I don't care about that. I was just trying to experience working with Chris in a different way. So I wanted him to write the record for me. It, it wasn't about the money, the royalties. I didn't care about none of that. It was about the... You know what I'm saying? The, the 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 chemistry. And I wanted to work with Chris in that way. I thought Chris was a dope lyricist and everything. And so I just, that's something I wanted to do. Got you. Um, Before we go down that lane, I, I got to ask you, you said your lawyer um, spoke to you about your options, whether it was, uh, you know, going with Birdman, you had several different options on the table. Well, well, it was this was just do I resign with Capital M I or disturbing the peace, Def Jam. Them the ones we was talking okay. about. But at okay. but at the same time, Birdman was trying to fly me down to Cali I'm a, my, Miami to have a meeting with him about getting with cash money. Fair enough. My my question to you is, is this the same lawyer that your mother hired? No. No, 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 no. Okay, no. okay. That, that's why I'm like, you no, stayed no, no. with that dude? <laughs> you know what's funny? This He used to be Easy e lawyer. <laughs> Ron oh, Sweeney. boy. He knew he, Ron Sweeney invented the game. But no, okay. hell no. 
Uh, <laughs> hell no. Okay. I just needed to clean that up for the sake of this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you, you sound back with Disturbing the Peace. This time it's distributed through Def Jam. Hate and Love It comes out, but it is not. Yeah. It, 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 it is not what those no. last three and albums what? was. By no stretch of the imagination. No stretch. And it was rushed. It was rushed. We, it, it, we didn't take the time. It was a total rush project. It wasn't set up right. It was so many things wrong with it. And we had a meeting with L.A. Reid, and he said the same thing. He said the exact same thing. And I think he blamed it on Disturbing the Peace, though. And Jeff took the blame. Jeff took the blame because mm. he said, yeah, we messed it up. We dropped the ball. Okay. Um, you only did one album with them. You didn't, didn't, at didn't that your, point. Your fifth I was, album comes out. I was, t you know what, at this point, I wanted to quit. I, w I wanted to stop doing music. Really? Yeah, after that. Something something that you have been doing literally yeah. since six years old. Yeah. After the that business. album, you wanted to quit music. Yeah, the business. The business made me not want to do it no more. I hated the business aspect and how and how that affected my career when I ain't even making none of these decisions. I ain't I ain't the one doing none of this shit. But here it is affecting my career, affecting me, hurting me. And I ain't doing none of this shit. I ain't the one making the business decisions to make it fuck up. I got tired. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't want to deal with that no more. So I was like, I'm, a, I'm just going to chill out, take some personal time. And I actually, um, me and Chris spoke and I told him that. This is how I got off Disturbing the Peace. I, I kind of told Chris I didn't want to be on, I didn't want to be on, be on no more. I was just like, I'm, I'm kind of tired. I'm, and this is not, this is not a, a, a stab at Disturbing the Peace. This has nothing to do with Disturbing the Peace as a whole. This is a personal decision. I'm just tired. I want to get away from this. And we talked about that. And I ended up getting off. And um, yeah, and that happened. And so. Yeah, it, it seems like musically, that's where it all took a turn, right? You know, I mean, obviously, little things have been happening throughout your career, but th that lightning in the bottle that you captured it was never recaptured. You 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 have a fifth album that comes out, um, success and failure. It didn't do as well as your previous four albums. Musically, you just wasn't able to catch that lightning in a bottle that you did back in the days. Where are you at mentally at this point? I know you said right after the Third album, you really just want the fourth album. You just wanted to walk away from music. Mm -hmm. You yeah. came back for for a fifth. It didn't go as planned. Are you really now like yo? I, I don't even want to do. Like I, I made the wrong decision even coming and doing this fifth album. But I got to tell you what that fifth album was about. So that fifth album, all of those songs on success and failure, that was a mixtape. I was rapping over other artists' beats. I was about to release that for free. I was rapping over other art. All those songs are songs of me rapping on other artists' beats. Fon Universal Fontana got in touch with me about doing a project. So basically what I did for those songs of me rapping over other people's beats, which I just freestyled a lot of them, I sold for about $50,000. Uh. That's what success and failure is. They had some new tracks remade, and they got a couple artists on the, on the tracks. So for me, I didn't care really much what it did. For me, I just grabbed a little 50000 That was a mixtape. If you know me, I make music like this. I make so much music, it's ridiculous. That was a mixtape, and half of them were freestyled songs. So I said, sure, here, take it. Give me the 50,000, take that. Give me some points. Voila. And that's success and failure. <laughs> Got you. Okay, um, didn't know that. You know, 
and I and I kind of jumped the gun in your timeline because this album dropped in 2010, I believe, but 2009, uh, and I'll call her by name, Sydney Starr. Uh-huh. She made some allegations, started some rumors. Yep. That you and her had a relationship. Yep. In 2014, Sydney openly admitted, which which I think was very classy, and the right the damage thing was to do done it, at that point, though. That she lied about it. Go, go, yeah, the go damage ahead. was done. Um, so how that even happened? I remember I had a show. Me and Chris had a show. I think Twister was there as well in Chicago. Before Chris went on, you know, me and the crew and everybody, you know, we going on stage. We finna go up there and go on stage, fuck with Chris, and just check the show out. Well, with some girls who we thought was all girls on stage in body paint dancing. While I'm on stage, mm-hmm. one happened to ask, say they're a fan of mine and want a picture. I took the picture. Next thing you know, two years later, all of this false stuff comes out nobody knows nothing about. <laughs> And that's literally how that went. It's nothing else to it. Which caused me to lose a record deal that I had been working on for years. I coming out to what, L- what do you mean you lost a record deal behind yeah. that? Just over I was a rumor? in I was in negotiations with um Interscope about doing a deal. Man, I was flying out to California, getting on yachts, going on the water with these people, eating fruit, doing all type of stuff. <laughs> to secure this deal, they said that was so big on social media, they didn't want to go through with it. Wow. And I lost a record deal from a lie. And that's what happened. It's that simple. There's nothing else to it. I took a picture with an individual who I guess listened to somebody or had some evil intentions of wanting to be famous, lied on me because this individual took lots of pictures with lots of artists. The individual took pit- other pictures with artists that same night. Why I was targeted, I, I don't know. But I lost a record deal, and the individual eventually came out and said they lied. By, by then, the damage was done, because all the, all the people who blew it up when the individual lied on me, that same energy wasn't there when the individual came out and said the truth. So damage was done. It's unfortunate in this um, world we live in, that's the way it always is. Uh, The media, it it gives so much energy to the negative. It gives so much energy to that tabloid uh, clickbait type. But, But whenever it is found out that this was not true, the same outlets that put so much time, energy into putting that story out there to the world, they're never there to say we made a mistake. They, did, they, they didn't. They didn't do that. They didn't do that. Yeah, question, um, before I move on, have you and Sydney ever had an opportunity to speak? Have you ever seen her out anywhere? Have you ever sat down with her and said, nah. why, why me? No. Nah, I, I, and to be honest, I don't really have no interest to do that. Um, the individual tried to reach out to my people, try to, you know, um, get with me, but I don't really got an interest in doing that. It is what it is. And I put it in the past. I put it in the past, but I don't really, I ain't got too much to, I don't, we ain't got nothing to talk about. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like that happened and I put it in the past and it's cool, but ain't nothing to really discuss faith. Ain't nothing. I don't, I'm cool. Understood. You know, I know yours was a rumor. I'm not even sure if this is a rumor, but there are definitely um, photos of her out there with with Darius McCrary, um, Eddie Winslow, you know, kissing. I mean, it's just crazy. She's clearly making her rounds. But see, that's, but see, here's the thing. People believe that. They that that's actually showing you they actually showing you what's going on. You know what I'm Correct. saying? Versus 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 me taking the picture and that's it. 
They showing you the intimacy. That picture I took was innocent. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, so believe that. Believe what's real. Don't believe what's fake. <laughs> mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, that was interesting. I mean, um, Ed, Eddie Winslow. I'm like, word. But be it as to it may, let's own. keep it moving. Um, to each his own. What'd you say? I said to each his yeah, own. Yeah, to each his own. Because you know yeah, what? God bless him. You know what? After that happened, um, I was about to stop taking pictures with um, with homosexual individuals because I felt like they may try to do something like that. But then I said, you know what? Everybody else ain't did nothing to me. I ain't gonna do that because I I got fans that's homosexual, and I don't. I have nothing against them. Why would I stop taking pictures with them for what this individual did? So I took that risk or chance. You know what I'm saying? Because I appreciate my fans. Correct. Okay. 2013. You announced that you're, you're a practicing black Hebrew Israelite. Where, where does that come from? <laughs> Black Hebrew Israelite. Well, on my mystical spiritual journey, you know, you run into people who who think they know a lot of things, godly things on this, on that. Oh, black Israelites, we the tribe of this. And I tested the waters. But it was it was all it was all in in um good faith of, you know, just on a journey to find righteousness of self. But what I came to realize is these things is not literal and we are not, there's no, these things are not literal. I came to understand them be, to be something else than what people say they are. And it's all about knowing self. And I'm going to just say this. And I'm going to leave it like this because I don't, people, you got some people religious, some people not. And I don't like to disrespect nobody. But I'm going to say this. Let's say you was drowning in a river. You had Jesus, Muhammad, Krishna, Buddha, and whoever else, these, these re religious entities, they're looking at you drown. You wouldn't give a shit who threw you a rope. You wouldn't care which one of them did it, right? Correct. Well... There you have it. They all talk about the same thing. Knowing self. Why would I treat an individual different who caters to this religion or this religion or this religion? They all speak about the same thing. Knowing self. Okay, so and that's what are it's about. you still a practicing? Okay, so you still a practicing black um, Israelite? No, no, no. I don't. I don't. I came to like I said. I came to understand what that's about. It 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 represents okay. something else. It represents um. It's astro theology. So so what black Israelites think black Israelites is is but an aspect of what's the constellations are given off through the zodiac signs. I ain't gonna get too deep into that science, but I don't practice. Hebrew Israelite things, I practice life itself. I practice knowing the knowing myself through knowing how this universe works. I'll say that. Okay. 2014, you go on couples therapy. Yeah. Reality TV. Yeah. <laughs> how real how how real was that? It was real. I mean, you might have times that was where real? you might have times where Let's say somebody getting into it, somebody might say, okay, um, amplify this part. But it was pretty much real. I watched it. You know, I think it's just, it's a show. So when things break, somebody might say, oh, um, jump when you're talking to them. If you're talking to them like this, we'll talk to them like this. So it was kind of like mm -hmm. that. Gotcha. But it was real. I watched, I watched a lot of real stuff happen. Okay. Got you. 2019 rolls around and Tiffany Haddish, 
you know, <laughs> she details hooking up with you. Now, T Tiffany Haddish ain't a bad person to hook up with, but you said that that wasn't true. So I got to ask so, you, what really happened? I'm finna, I'm finna tell you exactly. I'm going to tell you what happened, but I got to tell you. I did not remember that at all. My brother had to tell me that that happened. He said we all was drunk, high. Tiffany's was a friend of ours. She used to be around us. She knew, she used to hang with my DJ and my brother and them. I didn't know her like that, but I knew she used to be around. I used to speak to her and she was cool and she's still cool. But around this time, um, he said we was drunk, we was high. He was like, she liked you. You knew that. Oh, she knew that. But he was like, you, it wasn't like you was all on her. He said, we was in my room. She was all on you. We drunk. And things happened. I said, okay, my brother, I know he not lying. I didn't remember it. If I remembered it, I'd have just said, oh, okay, yeah, that happened. But I didn't know she was telling that story. See, I didn't know she was saying that in the public. I had no clue. So that was my first time hearing it. And immediately all I thought of was I ain't have sex with her because I did not remember that. We talking about a time where I used to get really drunk. Like I used to get fucked up. And so I didn't remember that. <laughs> and when my brother told me, yeah, no, it happened. He said, because I used to mess with a friend. I said, oh, OK. I know my brother ain't lying. So I respected it. I said, oh, OK. Maybe it did happen then. <laughs> crazy <laughs> oh and thanks for clearing that up because i'm like yo you got the worst luck on the planet you got all kind of people lying about being with you and, and i'm like yo if tiffany haddish come out and say it like that that ain't a bad person to be like yo you know what we hooked up it was more or less in my mind because i didn't remember i thought she was lying on me this is how i'm looking at it because i don't remember like i ain't just saying this i really did not remember that i still don't remember it if my brother didn't tell me that happened, I did. I don't remember. Nothing against Damn. Tiffany, but that's I'm just being authentic. And we talked after okay. that. Me and her talked after that. Me and her talked after that. Hmm. So it's cool. Like me and her, we talked after that situation. So ain't nobody tripping off that shit. Okay. Uh, shout to Tiffany Haddish. You know, 2022, Ludacris, he brought you out on stage in um, one of his shows in Indianapolis. Yep. I did a couple Not of them. Not too yep. far from your hometown. Yeah. Is this the first time y'all been on the stage together? Yeah. In like 15 years. Really? Yeah. How, in, in how long? In 15 years? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So it's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Great experience. Bring back, bring back the old memories. Yeah, man. It was fun. Because, you know... Even when I do my part, I'll just stay out there and hype man with him on his on the records. Nah, that's dope. Yeah. And that's the way it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be love. Yeah, that's what it's about, love and light. Absolutely. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but uh, Estee Lauder exec, John yeah. Dempsey. Yeah. Did you see the meme that he posted? So check this out. Go ahead. I have a, a, this guy named Christopher who was just at my show in Philly. He's a, he's a huge fan of mine. He made that meme. He made that meme. Um, Mr. Ramsey just commented on it. He commented on that meme. So he didn't repost it. He, I ain't sure if he reposted it, but I know he he commented on it. He may have reposted it, uh -huh. but he commented on it and reposted it, I guess. Now, mm -hmm. I saw the meme. I didn't. I don't know how everybody else in this existence look at things and perceive things. I didn't take it. No, I didn't take it. Personally, me, I didn't take it no type of way. We talking about somebody, somebody else created that.
That man didn't create that. Somebody else made that meme. He just reposted it or commented. And I think dude almost lost his job or something or something happened. Well, well, it ain't no almost about it. He, oh, he did, did lose his job. Yeah, he did lose. But but here's the thing. That man was making something like 10 mil a year. Yeah. Like this was not, this wasn't somebody who worked in the mail room at right. Estee Lauder. This man was high up on the food well, chain. Well, that just tell me somebody wanted him out and they was looking for any little thing to happen to get him out. Yeah. Because I didn't Crazy. see, I, I personally didn't think he did anything wrong. I'm just being honest. I thought yeah, that I was. I bet a, you to this day he. Go ahead. No, I mean he he's a middle aged white man. You know, probably in his fifties or something. To lose a ten million dollar a year job over a, re, a post, post, a repost, or a comment, a repost, a comment, whatever it might be, from a young hip hop artist, I know he's like. What the but guess F? what? Like, are you serious? But guess what? See, here's the thing. I had nothing to do with that. Nothing. My name just was in a, a picture. I had nothing to do with that. Nothing at all. My name was in a picture. That's the only thing. I had people associating me with something that I had nothing to do with. My name is in a picture. The dude who made the picture is a big fan of mine. And guess what he said? He did it on purpose. His plan was to get people to do exactly what they did because he loved me that much. So that's who that's who did that. A fan of mine. I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> wow. But you see how, see how. My name just stays in pe people. I don't know why people choose to want to just, they always like to talk about me and put me in situations that I have nothing to do with. I mean, you're a public figure, brother. That means you something. It comes with the territory. Exactly. It, it, it comes with the territory. What are you working on these days? You're looking like an R&B singer. Like, like I almost oh, wouldn't no recognize you singer. as a rapper. <laughs> what 50 say? <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, nah, I ain't talking about no R&B singer. You say I look like an R&B singer. <laughs> nah, but yeah, you, you, you just mean I'm, I'm looking real fly. That's, I get it. You just mean I'm looking fly. Yeah, I got you. you. I got you. Nah. Um, okay, so I just I dropped my new single, Can't Blame Me. On the 26th of August, y'all go stream that. Stream that on all platforms. It's a great record, just about, kind of about a lot of stuff we've been talking about, trials and tribulations, fake rumors, sabotaging, just different things like that. And me weaving that imbalanced energy out. And you can't blame me for weaving that imbalanced energy out. That's basically what it's about. Um, I'm work My new album, Chingless, should be dropping top of the year. Great project. Um, it shows a lot of growth for us, maturity and my conscious awareness. So I think people uh, respect that about the project. And it's a great project. If you, it's not, it's not what you're hearing now, not your average trap music, all that. It's chingy. I got those elements in a song or two, but it's chingy. So when you hear it, you're going to hear it's chingy and a different sound. Um, I got my cologne, Catch Cologne. I actually brought, I ain't have, they, I got samples. But I, I got I brought Vlad I got Vlad one. I'll be sure to, I gotta get you one. I get everybody else one as well. But I got um I don't have too many at the moment. And so I got Vlad one. Um uh, one of the colognes is called Catch for Men that I that I had made and pretty pretty good fragrance. I got a women a woman's one coming. I got the samples for that just then, but I gotta get it all made and stuff. So it's called Caught, but it smells great. And I'm trying to handle the business so I can present them at the same time. Um, yeah, man, and I'm 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 trying to I'm trying to get things the business straight for this TV show that I'm trying to um, get going. And you know we got the Millennium Tour coming up October to like December, so the Millennium Tour I'm on that. Um, I'll be going overseas top of the year too, New Zealand, Australia, Australia with Nelly, a couple of other artists. And um, got that going. Just working, man, and you know, exercising, eating healthy, 
just just um disciplining myself mentally and staying focused and just enjoying breathing well I, you know i appreciate your time i appreciate um your energy because it very much is needed in this world that we live in it's positive it's inviting um and keep trying to bring light to this world my brother i like, will what 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 yeah it is it, it's very obvious that you are are doing your part in bringing love and light into into this to this world that could sometimes be a very dark place and i'm so gonna say I this. thank you on behalf of myself and in all of lad tv and I, I appreciate that and i'm gonna say this and i and i think a lot of people need to be more aware of this because it could free them i see a lot of people they be bickering about who's saying something about them on social media this this and that well when people learn how to embrace hate and dislike just like they embrace like and love it'll free your mind so embrace the dislike when people dislike you embrace it just like that person that like you you ask them why you like me so much but it's it's it, it, it's balanced and positive the same person that dislike you ask them well why you dislike me what i do why I dislike why you dislike me what i do to you Nine times out of 10, from my experience, when I ask somebody that say something crazy about me or dislike me, guess what they say? Oh, I didn't think he was gonna say nothing. I didn't think he was gonna respond to me. They don't really dislike me. They just wanna get a rise out of you. So embrace the dislike just like you embrace the like. You know what I'm saying? That's power, Absolutely. that's power. And power has the influence to change. And that's what I'm about. You did what I'm saying? So that's all I'm going to say. Learn how to embrace dislike just like you embrace liking. You know, I always compare existence to a thermometer. Why? We would like to think cold and hot is two things, but it ain't. Cold just gets hot. It's the degrees in between where you take it. Wise words. Thank you so much, Chingy. And um, best of luck, my brother. Yes, sir. Continue success and blessings. Appreciate the love.